Welcome to the first of our Your Child's Health University uh, presentations for this school year. And I'm Nancy Sanchez from Community Relations. I'm very pleased to have you here with us this evening and to present this um, uh, excellent uh, presentation our physician has brought. It's my pleasure, in fact, to introduce this evening uh, Dr. Megan Imrie, who is Assistant Clinical profession, uh, Professor of Pediatric Orthopedic Surgery, kind of a mouthful, for the Stanford School of Medicine at Lucille Packard Children's Hospital. Dr. Imrie is a graduate of Yale University and a UC San Diego School of Medicine grad. She did a residency here at Stanford, wherein she received the Resident Research Award. Her many interests and research areas include scoliosis, fractures, and other common pediatric orthopedic issues. Tonight, Dr. Emery is going to address common sports-related injuries in children and ways to keep our children healthy through all four seasons of sports. Please note that this lecture is being videotaped, um, but the question and answer period will not be videotaped. And it will be posted on our Packard well, uh, website as well as Stanford iTunes for you to review later or to share with, with others. So it's my pleasure to introduce tonight Dr. Emery. Thanks so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. And uh, thank you for being here. I know everybody has a busy schedule, especially this time of year. So uh, I appreciate you guys taking the time. So uh, tonight we're going to talk about trying to keep our kids or yourself healthy uh, throughout the entire year of playing sports. Uh, and we'll talk uh, first a little bit about how kids are different than adults, uh, mainly in terms of their skeleton and how that can affect injury patterns and uh, prevention. And then we'll focus uh, more specifically on injuries, starting with non-musculoskeletal injuries. So that basically means anything that's not your bones, muscles, tendons, ligaments, that kind of thing. And then look at acute injuries, or those injuries that mm, happen out of the blue one time, sort of bad luck, and what we can hopefully do to try to minimize those. Although, uh, as I said here, it's just sort of trying to prevent an unpredictable uh, event, which can be difficult. And then we'll focus a little bit more on chronic or overuse injuries, uh, and trying to prevent these in growing athletes. And then I'll just uh, touch on a few sort of popular sports for a few sports-specific recommendations. Uh, I just want to start by saying that my take-home point is that sports are great for kids, uh, and by no means should the prevention of sports injuries be not participating in sports because they definitely provide uh, physical fitness, coordination, discipline, teamwork, really time management, a, a number of uh, skills and qualities and experiences that are very valuable uh, to kids and to adults. And also to kind of keep in mind that life is a risky event. We can't prevent absolutely everything, and so some things will happen. Uh, bad luck exists. We say in medicine it's always better to be lucky than good, and uh, I think that's true as well just in life. Uh, but I think there are some things that can be done to help minimize uh, risk and maximize enjoyment. And then how can we minimize this potential injury and maximize the benefit of sports participation? So some parents would think that this is how you would stay healthy through all four seasons of sports, sort of put your kid in a bubble or protect them from absolutely everything. That's not quite feasible, and we'll talk a little bit about what can uh, be done. So just sort of a little bit more of an introduction of myself. Uh, as mentioned, uh, actually I grew up in this area, I don't know if that was mentioned, I grew up in Los Gatos, uh, about 30 minutes south from here. Went east for uh, uh, college and then went down to UC San Diego for med school came back to Stanford for residency, went down to uh, San Diego again for my fellowship at Rady Children's Hospital, and then came on here at faculty about two years ago. Uh, and in addition, I just wanted to mention that I speak to you also as a former athlete. So I was a competitive gymnast from the time I was six until I was 21 and graduated from college here in the Bay Area and then also uh, in college. So uh, I'm very familiar with doing a lot of sports and what the good and bad of that can be. So just kind of looking at the numbers, about 30 million children participate in organized sports at any one time. Uh, and par participation in high school athletics is increasing with more than 7.3 million high school students participating each year. And high school athletics account for more than 2 million injuries annually, including 500,000 doctor's visits and 30,000 hospitalizations. There are, uh, if you look just beyond high school athletes to include younger kids, there are 3.5 million sports-related health care visits per year in all patients under 15 years of age. And this has been estimated to cost society about $33 billion. And breaking it down by sport, basketball is sort of the most frequent offender. 
And this is not looking at uh, incidence of injury, so it's not that basketball is a more risky sport than anything else. It's just that more kids participate in basketball. basketball. And so even if you have a lower frequency of injury, if you have more people participating, then your numbers will be higher. So basketball, football, baseball are kind of the top. And then some of your more risky things like gymnastics are lower just because there are fewer kids uh, participating. Uh, so there's some thought that immature bones, insufficient rest after injury, and poor training and conditioning can all contribute to overuse injuries, not necessarily to acute injuries, although fatigue certainly can play a role in that. And that overuse injuries themselves account for half of all sports injuries in middle school and high school kids. And that'll sort of, sort of be the focus of the second half of this talk, because uh, that's really where we can focus on trying to prevent injury. So as part of the introduction, I want to talk about how kids are different uh, than adults. It's um, obviously many different ways, uh, but from an orthopedic standpoint and from an injury, uh, musculoskeletal injury standpoint, the biggest difference is that kids are still growing. And so this is a picture here on the left of a uh, x-ray of an, a child's ankle and on the right of an adult ankle. And what that arrow is showing is in the child on the left, a growth plate, and on the right in the adult, you see that the growth plate's not there anymore or the growth plate has fused. And so this is sort of the weak point of the pediatric skeleton is a growth plate, whereas an adult, once that fuses, the bone is actually pretty strong, and your weak point becomes more ligaments, tendons, muscles, and that shift doesn't happen one day. The growth plate doesn't close just one day. It's sort of a transition, and that adolescent time is a, a time of transition. And then all kids are not the same. Kids mature at a different rate, and especially when you get to that sort of preteen, teen, adolescent years, there's a marked variation in how mature kids are, how big they are, what their coordination is, strength is, stamina, body fat versus muscle. So you could have two 13-year-olds playing on a soccer field. One is 6'2 and weighs 200 pounds and is all muscle. And the other's voice hasn't changed and looks like he's 10. And that can lead to some uh, issues on the field in terms of injuries. So diving a little bit more into the growth plate, uh, a, because I think it's a very salient point, and B, because it's an amazing structure and one of the reasons why I went into pediatric orthopedics. The official name for it is the physis, and as I mentioned, it's the weak point in the skeleton. And the picture sort of to the top left, let's see if my pointer works, yeah. This is what it looks like histologically. Uh, and basically, what it is is a bunch of cartilage cells at the bottom of the growth plate that divide and divide and divide and sort of form these columns of cartilage that progress up towards uh, turning into bone. And it's almost like a taffy-like consistency, whereas bone is more like a hard candy. So you have a differential in strength and material properties between the growth plate and the bone. And also, sort of your growth potential lies within those specialized cartilage cells. So the growth plate is what I consider the best and the worst part about the pediatric skeleton, because when it goes well, it goes really well. So this is an example of a six-year-old child. His, uh, let's say, about six-week post-injury film, so six, week, six weeks after he fell and broke his arm. Those films are at the top. And you can see that the bone is healing in a pretty angulated way, looking at it both in the AP plane, which is if you looked at the hand just from straight on, and in the lateral plane if you look at it from the side. And this child was actually referred to our practice for a second opinion because the adult orthopedist who saw them had recommended surgery to fix this. Because in an adult, if your wrist looked like that, you would have significant dysfunction. But the x-rays below are the same exact child 18 months later, and you can see that because of a functioning growth plate, as the child's bone grows, it remodels over time. It's so much smarter than we could ever be, figures it out on its own, and straightens out over time. So this is what's the best thing about the pediatric skeleton is the mm, sort of potential and flexibility that the growth plate provides. However, it's also the worst thing about the skeleton because when things go wrong, they can go very wrong. So this is a picture on the left, an injury film of a child who had an ankle fracture. So the break, let's see where my pointer is. The break is right about here. So not nearly as dramatic as the x-ray on the previous slide, but you can see that there was a little bit of injury. And the x-ray on the right is that same child about four, probably six to seven months later. And you see a little bit of irregularity of the growth plate here. And these are standing films, meaning that the x-rays were taken when the child was standing up, bearing weight. And when you draw 
the alignment. You can see that because the growth plate has closed on the medial aspect or the inside part of the ankle, the bone is now growing crooked. So when the growth plate doesn't work, bones will grow crooked, bones will stop growing, and bad things can happen. And also, because of the properties of the, the growth plate, as I mentioned, it's a weak point in the skeleton at risk of injury, both acutely and in overuse conditions, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. And I also just want to say that I have a tendency to talk very fast, especially as I forget to talk slowly. So if you miss anything, please don't hesitate to stop me. Or if you have any questions as we go along, if I use a word that you don't, aren't familiar with, please don't hesitate to, to stop me, because most likely somebody else has the same question. So that's sort of the introduction. The main difference between kids and adults is the growth plate. Uh, and it's just also uh, differences in stamina, strength, balance, and the fact that that's changing every day because they're growing and changing every day. So moving on to injuries and starting with non-musculoskeletal injuries, we'll uh, talk first about sort of the serious stuff, and that is there are sports-related fatalities. It's extremely rare, but obviously very devastating. So these are kids who die because of a sports injury. And it's, uh, like I said, very infrequent, but can be due to one of three sort of categories, and that's cardiac events, head injuries, and then heat stroke. And heat stroke gets a lot of uh, uh, attention in the media, and so we'll talk a little bit about that. So in terms of cardiac events, or basically problems with the heart, the two main issues are what's called commotio cordis, which basically means that very rarely, if a ball or something hard strikes a, a child or even an adult's chest, very hard, it can actually mechanically stop the heart and disrupt the electrical activity of the heart and basically more or less cause the heart to stop, cause a heart attack. Very rare, that's why, especially in hockey, you wanna wear chest protection because if the hockey puck hits you at a pretty high velocity, uh, that could be a potential um, injury. And the most important thing is rapid rec recognition and immediate CPR on the field. Uh, and so there shouldn't, hopefully in schools and certainly at competitions or meets, there should always be somebody around who is CPR certified and could administer that if necessary. And this would not be subtle. This would be somebody who gets hit, drops, doesn't move, isn't really breathing, doesn't, doesn't look good. So it's, it's not subtle at all and very, very, very rare. And then the other uh, cardiac event is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And this is uh, a condition of the heart where the heart muscle is bigger than it should be. Uh, and if you've ever heard of, uh, I think in the past there were some basketball stars who were otherwise totally healthy and one day just dropped dead on the court, uh, it's because of this hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And that's why we recommend a pre-participation physical for your physician to evaluate uh, your mainly family history because this tends to be familial. So uh, patients will have a parent or a grandparent who died suddenly of a, a heart condition, usually in their 20s or 30s. Uh, and it's tough to pick up on physical exam. There are some things that can be detected, um, but this is one of the reasons why the pre-participation pre physical exam is required, especially in collegiate athletics, because it tends to be in a more mature uh, kid that it would affect. Very rare, but just to be complete, I wanted to cover those. In terms of head injuries, what we're talking about here is a concussion. And this is uh, seen mostly in football, which is a high intensity, high impact sport, but can be seen in other sports if, say in soccer, two players are trying to head the same ball and their heads collide, or basically any time the head strikes something hard. And uh, basically, the brain has some movement in the head. It's not perfectly fixed. And so if you move really quickly, the brain can move forward, hit the front of your skull, and then move back and hit the back of the skull and cause some bruising and bleeding, so to speak, uh, in the brain. And why it's important, obviously it's your brain. You only have one of them, so you want to make sure that you treat it well. Uh, and then also, especially in younger patients, the second impact syndrome, so if a patient goes back to play, or if an athlete goes back to play before they fully recovered, and they're unlucky enough to have a second event, that second event is way worse than the first event if they haven't recovered fully because you can have a rapid onset of what's called cerebral edema or brain swelling that can lead to death within minutes. So it's very important for patients, excuse me, for athletes to be fully recovered before they go back. 
So if it's a first time concussion, the recommendations are to take the player out for 15 minutes, see how they're doing. If they have no signs or symptoms of a concussion, which are listed here on the right, uh, and that includes headache, dizziness, confusion, some unsteadiness, repetitive questioning, disorientation. Certainly if they lose consciousness, that's a big red flag. Uh, if they can't remember exactly what happened, even things like irritability, nausea, vomiting, etc. If they're totally fine after 15 minutes, they've observed, excuse me, exhibited none of those symptoms, then you want to stress them a little bit, kind of get uh, blood flow to the brain, increase blood flow to the brain by doing either a sit-up or a push-up or having them bear down. All those things increase blood flow to the upper part of the body into the brain. See how they do, and if they're okay, then they can go back into uh, competition. I'd say the safest thing is just to leave them out for the rest of the game, uh, especially if it's not the NFL and there's you know not a ton riding on it. It's probably better to say, hey, listen, you hit your head, hey, just sit out. Just relax for the rest of the game. But if they're okay, they can go back. However, they should not go back in the same game if they've ever lost consciousness, and certainly if they lost consciousness is uh, part of this episode, if they've ever had a concussion in the past, uh, or if they have any signs or symptoms of a concussion, they should be kept out. And then finally, heat stroke. Uh, children and adolescents are especially prone to heat stroke for a couple of reasons. For one, uh, they can't really regulate their temperature as well, and maybe that's why kids can swim in a freezing cold ocean at Santa Cruz without even thinking about it, and we can't, although I have a feeling it's just distraction. But they have a harder time regulating their body temperature. They don't sweat as much, uh, and they have a harder time uh, acclimatizing to the environment, so it takes them longer to sort of adjust their body temperature to the outside environment. And so the guidelines are fairly common sense, uh, and that is, uh, to give time, so you don't want to go from an uh, air-conditioned uh, locker room to a 110-degree field with no, you know, start practice right away with no sort of time to adjust. Uh, you want to evaluate the weather conditions beforehand. You want to make sure that it's not going to be 115 degrees and 99% humidity. Thankfully, in California, this is a little bit less of an issue, but certainly we do have our share of hot days. You want to make sure that there's scheduled rest in the shade. Look for participants who are at particular risk, and I would say that'd be anybody who had an issue in the past or just really isn't looking good. Uh, hydrate definitely before practice and during competition. You don't want to wait till you're thirsty. By the time you're thirsty, that you're already dehydrated, so you want to sort of stay on top of it and prehydrate, so to speak. Have chilled fluids readily available. Enforce periodic drinking. Never ever use water restriction as a form of discipline, and I definitely had coaches who did things like that and it's just not nice and not safe. Uh, and then also discourage deliberate dehydration for weight loss, and that's, I'd say, most common in wrestling for weight class as well as rowing to basically stay under the weight uh, for your particular class in rowing. Uh, and then make appropriate clothing adjustments, and that's mainly in football to take the helmet off in between plays when you're not out on the field so that most of our heat loss in the body occurs through the head, and if you have your helmet on, the body can't release that heat, so you want to take your helmet off. Uh, and then if you can, avoid scheduling events during noontime when it's going to be hot and sunny. Educate players and parents on what to look for, which again, thirst, dizziness, just not feeling well. Uh, and then some people will recommend daily weights, and I think this is more for Texas football, but recording daily weights to ensure that between practices, patients are adequately rehydrating, because a lot of our fluctuations in weight is water weight, so to speak. And then finally, just touching briefly on performance enhancing substance use, uh, it's estimated that 10 to 20 percent of adolescent athletes use some kind of form of performing enhancing drugs, and the most commonly known of this would be uh, steroids. And there are significant side effects, uh, some of which are cosmetic, which for the adolescent brain is sort of the more important part. They don't uh, plan as well for the future. It's harder for them to uh, anticipate something that they do now affecting them poorly in the future. Research on smoking uh, has really shown that, that telling a kid that their teeth are going to be brown and they're going to have bad breath now is much more effective than telling them that they'll have cancer in 30 years. And so the same sort of thing applies to steroids. I think kids, adolescents, would be more receptive to the fact that if you take steroids, you'll have pimples, you'll lose your hair where you're supposed to have it, and gain hair where you're not supposed to have it, rather than saying things like, well, you'll have a higher risk of stroke, or your balls will shrink, 
or you'll have irregular periods where things are a little bit less salient to them, but certainly more important, so to speak. And so I just recommend that as parents, teachers, coaches, et cetera, that performance enhancing substances are included in any drug or alcohol conversation, uh, that they can be as destructive and as bad for you uh, as other substances. And so just include them and have that discussion openly uh, because there are a lot of kids who are using these without us really knowing it. Any questions so far? So moving on to acute events, trying to prevent those unpredictable events. About 95% of these sports injuries that happen quickly are minor and usually from a minor trauma. So rolling an ankle, tripping and falling on a wrist, that sort of thing. Uh, and it can range from sprains, which is a ligament issue, to strains, which is a, a problem with a muscle or tendon, or contusions, which is a nice fancy word for bruise. And you can bruise your muscle, and you can also bruise your bone. And the MRI here basically shows what bone looks like when it gets bruised, and basically has more fluid than it should. And the general prevention recommendations are basically make sure that you have proper and proper fitting equipment. Excuse me. And so. This includes things like shin guards in soccer, make sure your shoes aren't too tight, make sure your shoes are tied. I mean, really kind of common sense sort of things that because they're so common sense, people often overlook them. Uh, and then also following guidelines for team sports for matching. So trying to match uh, kids not just by age, but more by weight and playing ability so that you don't have two players rushing towards each other, one of whom has two times the body mass and two times the force than the other. Uh, and the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, the Pediatric Orthopedic Society of North America, Canadian Orthopedic Association, and the American Association of Sports Medicine Physicians have come up with this Play It Safe campaign where they focus and encourage kids uh, to be in proper, proper physical condition to play a sport. So recommending not using a sport to get into shape, but actually trying to get into shape before your sport to minimize injury to know and abide by the rules of the sport. The rules are usually there for a reason. Uh, to wear appropriate gear uh, and to know how to use the equipment. So make sure you know how to adjust your ski bindings or how your shin guard should fit or how your mouth guard should go. Uh, and then always warm up before playing and avoid playing when tired or in pain because your rea uh, reaction time, your balance, your ability to self-correct will be compromised if you're tired or in pain. Even, and this isn't a conscious thing, it's a subconscious sort of body reaction to fatigue and pain. So I wanted to focus on kind of two specific things just to uh, make it a little bit less general, a little bit less vague. And so I'll start with trampoline and bouncy house injuries. This isn't truly sports, but if you ask any three or four year old, a bouncy house is, should be an Olympic sport. And there are about 110,000 uh, trampoline or bouncy house uh, related injuries per year according to the US Consumer Product Safety Commission. And that's much less than bike or uh, many other types of injuries, but still a significant number. And injuries can range from very mild sprains to even fractures requiring surgery or cervical spine injuries or more serious things. And the main tips that we've found uh, to minimize risk include that uh, to be on a trampoline specifically, kids should be older than six, because if you're younger, that, younger than that, you don't really have the balance or the coordination to self-correct if you get a little bit out of control to try to ensure that only one person on the trampoline uh, is on the trampoline at, at, at a time. When we look at kids who visit the emergency department with a trampoline injury, many times, I think about 50% of the time, they're on the trampoline with somebody else, and that other person's bouncing force threw them off because they weren't anticipating it. If there's gonna be more than one child uh, bouncing, and I think that for a trampoline, that should be a pretty consistent rule, only one person, but for a bouncy house, you know, the fun of the bouncy house is being in with other kids. So if you're gonna be in with other kids, everybody should be about the same weight, so that you don't have one much heavier, much larger child, who when they bounce will sort of toss the other kids around a bit more. And that means for the trampoline, as a parent, uh, to try to, if you are gonna be on the trampoline, don't really bounce too much, uh, or if you can, if your child's old enough to just watch from the sideline and take your turn. Uh, they should be supervised at all times, no tricks unless you're a gymnast or a diver, and then follow all instructions for the safety equipment. Uh, and that includes, uh, ideally for a trampoline, it would be in ground, uh, and then also for bouncy houses, ensuring that they're secured uh, very well to the ground. About, I think six or seven years ago, uh, we had a, a case here where a bouncy house in, I think, Los Altos Hills, 
was not securely, pro uh, securely fastened. It actually rolled down the hill with some kids in it and there were a bunch of uh, children who came in with injuries. So you always want to follow the safety guidelines. So that's sort of for younger kids. Uh, looking at one other specific injury that we can try to prevent is ACL injuries. The ACL is the anterior cruciate ligament. It's here in yellow on the image on the right. Uh, and basically, it's one of the main ligaments of the knee that helps prevent your shin bone from moving too much in relationship to your thigh bone. And you've probably heard a fair amount of this in the media because there are a lot of athletes who have ACL injuries. And the reason why it's a, an issue is because since the ligament is inside the joint, it can't heal on its own. There are other ligaments in the body that if you tear them, will heal up on their own with rest and mobilization. But the ACL, because it's exposed to the joint fluid, can't repair itself. So if it's torn, many times we have to replace it with surgery in order for a patient to go back to playing high-level sports. And obviously in kids, we want to avoid surgery as much as possible. And it, certainly in children who still have open growth plates, the surgery becomes more complicated because we have to avoid the growth plate or cross the growth plate with a repair, and then we worry about disrupting the growth of the leg. So we pay a lot of attention to ACL re, uh, injuries for these reasons. And our research has shown us that young women who are aged 15 to 25 years old are two and a half to nine and a half times more likely to sustain a non-contact ACL injury than males in the same age group. So depending on what study you read, it ranges anywhere from two and a half to nine times. And non-contact means that they tore their ACL not because they collided with another player, but doing something on their own, either landing from a jump, pivoting, going for a ball, that sort of thing. And this is becoming an increasing problem because thankfully girls are participating more and more in sports. So for high school sports specifically, uh, female participation has increased by 700% over the last 15 years. So that's great. Um, but if we can prevent ACL injuries and if girls are more susceptible to them, then we should look into what we can do. And soccer and basketball are the sports that are probably the most frequent culprits, although it certainly happens with other types of activities. And basically, through research, uh, they found that the increased risk uh, of girls versus boys is thought to be a little bit related to girls' anatomies. So females usually have wider hips, especially adolescents. You're starting to move into sort of your more womanly body. So the hip is a little bit wider. So girls may have a little bit increased valgus at their knees, meaning they're a little bit more knock-kneed than their boy counterparts. And they also then, partly related to their anatomy and partly related, I think, to uh, some gender differences that we still don't completely understand, they can land from a jump differently. So the girl landing on the left is sort of the more proper or more ACL protective or more male-like to land, which is knee spread out real wide, nice deep squat, sort of absorbing the energy. Whereas the girl on the right, girls more frequently land from a jump in that way where the knees kind of buckle in, their landing is a little bit more shallow, and that puts a lot of torque on the ACL. So after researching the differences between landing and girls versus boys, uh, some uh, uh, researchers have come up with a specific exercise program that focuses on the strength, endurance, and power of the protective muscles around the knee. Look at balance, look at coordination, and really putting all of these things together and trying to teach girls a new way to land, especially in basketball. And the figure down below shows some of those exercises that they do. And they've shown that pre-participation in a focused plyometric uh, program like this has reduced the incidence of ACL tears in uh, collegiate female athletic populations. So using these exercises, incorporating them into practice, into training, has shown uh, to decrease ACL tear rates. So that's great. Any questions on acute injuries? So looking at overuse uh, injuries, the reason why uh, we care is A, injuries are just bad, pain is bad, but also injury in childhood can be a risk factor for future injury, both uh, during a patient or a athlete's youth, uh, as well as into adulthood. And sometimes this can be a contributor to long-term degenerative diseases such as osteoarthritis. So the things that are happening now do have an impact in the future. And when we talk about overuse, what we mean is excessive and repeated use that can result in injury to the bones, muscles, or tendons uh, involved in the action. And this is uh, 
you know, a big issue for many reasons. And I would say that it's not uncommon uh, for us to see patients in clinic as well uh, who are complaining of a chronic pain and continuing to do their sport. And some of it may be pain, but some of it may also be that they don't want to do the sport anymore. Either it's not fun anymore because it's painful or their interests have changed, but because of coach pressure, parent pressure, even self pressure, they may continue to be doing that activity. So this cartoon is out of a, a great book called Staying Out of Trouble in Pediatric Orthopedics, and it heads the section on injuries. And basically it's got the doctor saying, her chronic shoulder pain persists despite therapy. All imaging tests are negative. Frankly, her shoulders may not be suited for year-round swimming. And the mom is saying, you don't understand, swimming is her life. The coach is saying, you don't understand, she's an Olympic swimmer. And the kid's saying, you don't understand, I just want time with my friends. And so it's always important to keep in mind that an overuse injury or sort of a chronic pain or chronic injury may be either consciously or more often subconsciously a kid's way of trying to communicate that they don't want to do the sport anymore potentially. So it's important for us as physicians and for parents to kind of keep that in mind. Sometimes you can take it too far. Uh, when I was doing gymnastics, if I ever complained of pain, the first thing out of my mom's mouth was, you can quit if you want to. Do you want to quit? Please quit. I'm tired of driving you 45 minutes back and forth to practice, so do you want to quit? And the answer was always no. But So you can take it a little bit too far, but it's important to kind of keep it in mind. So, <coughs> excuse me. The uh, STOP campaign that Dr. Levine was mentioning uh, came out of the fact that in sort of the late 90s and early 2000s, uh, orthopedists were starting to see almost a meteoric rise in these overuse uh, injuries in pediatric athletes. And this is really the brainchild of Dr. Jim Andrews, who's a very uh, renowned uh, sports orthopedist who practices out of Alabama. And he was seeing a lot of overuse injuries and a lot of sort of adult type injuries in younger and younger patients, and most specifically uh, injuries to the elbow ligaments in young baseball pitchers. Uh, and Dr. Levine was talking a little bit about this conception of surgery, and that's something that Dr. Anders noticed as well, uh, that the Tommy John surgery, Tommy John was a, a famous pitcher who had a ligament reconstruction, and says, and I think the data shows that he actually was a better pitcher after the surgery, so there was sort of this misconception perpetuated in some circles that the surgery would make you better, would make you stronger. And so seeing these uh, injuries and seeing almost a cavalier attitude of some parents towards their kids' injuries really got uh, Dr. Andrews and a lot of us uh, you know, paying attention and concerned. So STOP stands for Sports Trauma Overuse Prevention, uh, developed by Dr. Andrews in Alabama. And it's been endorsed by many professional organizations as well as athletes. And sort of the three main people are Dr. Andrews, uh, I'm blanking on his name right now, Sam Bradford, right? Is that his name? Rams quarterback who is an Oklahoma Sooners, I think that's his name, and then John Smoltz who is a baseball pitcher, and they've done a lot of community service. Uh, I'll give you the website at the end that's got a lot of great information, but they've really sort of been championing this around the country. And their mission is to keep kids in the game for life. So they don't want kids to stop, stop playing sports, they want sports to remain enjoyable, kids to remain injury free so that they can continue to participate as long as they want. And the proposed reasons for the increase in injuries uh, were their immature bones, insufficient rest after an injury, poor training or conditioning, and really the uh, specialization in just one sport with year-round participation. So in the 90s, 2000s, when they were seeing this rise in injuries, it also somewhat correlated with a shift in uh, or an increase in travel teams, uh, you know, camps, and really the ability to do one sport year-round, where say in the 60s, you couldn't really play basketball competitively all year if you wanted to. You couldn't really play baseball all year if you wanted to. You had to kind of specialize if you wanted to play a sport throughout the year. You had to do different ones. And so there's some thought that that correlated. So some of the recommendations uh, is, again, common sense stuff. Uh, holding ongoing discussions about the importance of rest. Kids think that they're invincible. Sometimes we think that they're invincible and don't need as much rest because they seem to be doing fine, but they, their bodies do need rest. They do need to recover. The manda uh, mandating of preseason physicals, looking not only for some of those serious things that I was talking about, like a cardiac history, but also looking to see if they have any subtle injuries that maybe they don't really think about or didn't notice or don't want to mention because they don't want to not make the team, they don't want to not be able to participate in tryouts, but really 
picking that up and holding them back if they aren't 100%, enforcing warm up and cool down routines, encouraging proper strength training, again, preparing kids' bodies appropriately um, before they go out into competition. And then really trying to encourage participation for fun, limit emphasis on uh, winning so the kids may feel more comfortable saying that something hurts that they want to, or that they feel like they need to stop. As mentioned, discourage early special specialization, treat things early, and then for the heat stroke, make sure you drink enough water, uh, educate athletes on proper nutrition for performance, make sure they're eating well, drinking enough, et cetera, make sure that the equipment's maintained well, and then encourage kids again to speak up if they have any issues, not feel that, that's, that they're gonna be punished for that. Uh, so again, kind of, we're gonna sort of beat a dead horse here, so let me know if I'm becoming too repetitive. Uh, but it's important to play multiple sports, especially when you're younger. So studies have shown that 70% of kids who are younger than 13 years of, old, years of age that only specialize in one sport up to that point will drop out of organized sports, uh, and they say that it's due to burnout. So if you want your kids to participate in sports for life, you might want to encourage that they try different things. Again, listen to your child and listen to your child's body. And for me, one of the most important things is if your kid is limping, that's a outright physical sign that they're doing too much, that they need to back off, that they have some injury that needs recovery. And then uh, have your child be prepared, both physically, make sure that they're strong, that their endurance is good, that they're stretching, and then also that they're prepared mentally for what their sport may entail as best as you can. So just a quick point on stretching, because uh, I do think that this is very important, and I do see a lot of kids in my clinic who have uh, injuries, I think, related to tight muscles and a lack of stretching. And basically, uh, stretching is especially important during rapid phases of growth. Uh, so that'll be, again, sort of preteen years 12, 13, 14, when you're growing at your fastest. And the way I think of it is that the bones are growing faster than the muscles can keep up. So kids will get a, a little bit tighter, if not, you know, measurably so, at least functionally so. And places where big muscles insert next to growth plates will be, a, again, a weak point of the skeleton, coming back to the fact that the growth plate is a weak point of the skeleton. So looking at this picture here, this is an x-ray of a knee, looking at the knee from the side. And this sort of shaded box, what it's showing is the growth plate at the knee, the anterior growth plate. So if you've ever heard of Oscar Schlatter's, it's a pretty common knee condition. And basically it results from a big, strong, tight quad tendon that inserts through the patella, that becomes the patellar tendon, and then inserts right on the front part of your shin bone, right in the anterior tibia. And it's right next to that growth plate. So that muscle, every time you're running, kicking, squatting, is pulling on that bone. And that taffy-like growth plate is stretching, is getting stressed, is getting inflamed. And so that's what Ajkud Schlatter's is. And if you stretch properly, keep that muscle loose, there won't be quite so much of a pull on that growth plate and the pain either won't happen or will subside fairly quickly. And this is sort of the equivalent of patellar tendonitis in an adult. So once that growth plate fuses, it's a solid bone, that's no longer the weak point. The weak point is now where the tendon attaches to the bone or within the tendon itself. So what can be a tendonitis in an adult is often uh, what we would call a physitis or an inflammation of the growth plate in a kid just because of the differences in their skeleton. And the same condition can happen in the heel that's called Seaver's apophysitis. And again, basically it's the big Achilles strong muscle coming down and inserting near a growth plate on the heel. And again, if you're not stretching enough, if your calves are tight, that big muscle is gonna be pulling near the growth plate and causing pain and inflammation at the growth plate. So I find stretching probably one of the best things you can do to prevent these sort of irritating knee and, and heel pain that many, many kids uh, have. All right, so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about some sport-specific recommendations. So I focused on sort of the three uh, top sports in the country and what I would say we see most often in our clinic here at Packard. So starting with basketball, it's the most popular sport in high school and the leading cause of sports-related injuries in the US, over a million and a half per year. Most common injuries are relatively minor, like ankle sprains and jammed fingers, but it can also include fracture, fractured fingers, knee injuries, the MCL, and then the dreaded ACL, bruising, facial cuts, foot fractures, including stress fractures. And the recommendations are uh, basically, again, maintain proper fitness, get ready for your season. Uh, there are higher injury rates if you're not in shape. 
don't go zero to 100% immediately. So don't not play at all and then play an entire game uh, without any uh, building up in the meantime. And that includes aerobic conditioning as well, strength and agility. And then again, consider an ACL prevention program, especially in your high school or collegiate athletes, and especially for girls programs, and try to incorporate it into the team's warm up, and then stay hydrated and avoid burnout. Baseball is probably the most studied in our field, probably because the injuries, I'd say, have the most lasting repercussions. Uh, and we have very good data on how uh, overuse and specialization in baseball can lead to injuries. And we're talking mainly about shoulder and elbow injuries, some of which are serious enough to ultimately require surgery. So we really pay a lot of attention to this. And so we're basically talking about what you may hear of as little leagues, leaguer's elbow and little leaguer's shoulder. And little leaguer's elbow is kind of a general term that means usually uh, pain on the inside part of the elbow or the medial part of the elbow, although it can refer to basically any pain about the elbow. The most common cause is what's, is what's called medial epicondylitis, and that's in that top drawing there. The left-hand side is the abnormal elbow, and the left-hand side is the normal elbow. And basically, hopefully it's big enough that you can see a little bit of widened space between this fleck of bone here and then the main part of the uh, elbow or the humerus versus this side, it's much closer. And again, this is a growth plate problem. So there's a growth plate in between the medial epicondyle, which is the bony part on your own elbow that you feel if you hit, if you hit right behind it, that's your funny bone. In a kid, that's usually separated from the humerus, so that's always separated from the humerus by a growth plate until it fuses in adolescence. So it's a weak point in the skeleton, especially with throwing, especially with pitching. You have a lot of force across the elbow and it can separate through the physis. It can also refer to something called osteochondritis desiccans, which is uh, part of the cartilage can break off uh, from the elbow, especially in gymnasts and baseball players, or the ulnar collateral ligament tear, which is this Tommy John injury and the Tommy John surgery, which is seen in pitchers. Used to be seen only in adults, but now has been seen in kids because they're throwing too hard, too much, too early. And then little leaguer's shoulder, we're usually talking about proximal physeal inflammation or separation. So each bone has two growth plates, one at the top and one at the bottom. And so uh, that can be a weak point in the skeleton at each bone. And so in the shoulder, the proximal humeral physis is right about here. And so with a lot of pitching or with a lot of swimming, again, you can start to get some stress, even some separation of that growth plate indicating overuse, too much of the same motion, too much of the same activity. So again, Dr. Anders' group recently published a study, this was uh, in the American Journal of Sports Medicine uh, just this winter, looking at a 10-year prospective study of young baseball pitchers. And he looked at 40, 481 youth pitchers between nine and 14 year, uh, years of age and followed them for 10 years and looked at the incidence of injury. And they define injury not just as a little tweak or a sprain, but as one of three things, elbow surgery, shoulder surgery, or retirement from the sport because of a throwing injury. And of his find, there were many findings. To me, the most striking finding is of the 481 pitchers, only 2.2% were still pitching at the end of the study. So 98% had stopped pitching over the course of the 10 years. 5% uh, had serious injuries, so 5% of the 481 uh, had a serious injury, but that means that basically the remaining 93% that stopped did so for other reasons, and it's not clear if it was loss of interest or if they're better at other positions or if there's some other reason, but I thought that that was pretty, uh, pretty impressive. He found that if a pitcher pitched more than 100 innings per year, they were three and a half times more likely to sustain an injury requiring surgery of either their elbow, shoulder, or uh, a career ending injury, basically. And there was a trend to increase uh, risk of injury if a participant also played catcher during the same season. So catcher's a lot of stress on the body as well. And so those two may have somewhat of a cum cumulative effect, although the numbers in the study weren't big enough to be able to statistically say that that was uh, a finding. So, the recommendations for injury profession, and some of these are repetitive. Again, warm up properly, stretch, run, easy throwing, rotate playing other positions besides pitcher, 
concentrate on age appropriate pitching and I'll go over this in the next slide and sort of the little leagues recommendations as to when to throw what pitches how many pitches to throw per game and how many days of rest between pitching days that that, patient, that athletes should take uh, if there's pain pitchers should stop uh, and they if, if the pain persists even after they stop they should see a doctor uh, no consecutive days don't play year-round don't use a radar gun so that kids are only focusing on throwing as absolutely hard as they can. Uh, encourage communication about how the arm is feeling. Uh, again, emphasize control, accuracy, and good mechanics rather than just uh, the outcome, the speed, the uh, location, that kind of thing. Master the bat, uh, fastball first and then get to more complicated pitches. And then speak with a sports medicine professional or trainer if there are any concerns. So communication, rest, listening to your body. So these are from uh, the Little League guidelines, uh, looking at maximum pitch count per game. And basically, it goes up uh, from 50 to 105 as kids get older. And this is really sort of reflecting the strength of their skeleton as the growth plates are closing, as their uh, skeleton is getting stronger and more adult-like. They can pitch more and more, excuse me. This is required rest periods. And I would say, talking to patients in my clinic, these aren't necessarily followed, not routinely followed. Younger patients, less than 16, have much stricter guidelines, so more than 61 pitches in a day, not just in a game, but in a day. They should be taking off three days from pitching. Uh, and if you're pitching less than 20, 25, then that's not too many per day, so you can keep going. And then age recommendations for various pitches, and really the focus is on the curveball, waiting for the skeleton to get a bit more mature before applying the stress across the elbow that the curveball requires. And as a non-ball sport athlete, I don't completely understand some of these other ones. I've never heard of a forkball or a screwball, and I watch a lot of Giants baseball, so I'm not really sure what those pitches are. And if any of you know, I'd love to see them. And these are all online, by the way, the Little League guidelines. So just a few more words uh, on baseball. Uh, I would say that your child and you are your child's best advocate. So if your kid is playing on multiple teams, those coaches aren't going to be keeping track of what they're doing with their travel team or what they're doing with their school team. And so it's up to you or, you know, especially with an adolescent, it's, it's time for them to start taking responsibility for their body and for their health. And so they should be paying attention to this because nobody else is really going to be looking out for them necessarily. Uh, so I would say even though these are the recommendations in talking to patients, they're routinely not followed or kids just don't add it all up in their head. They don't realize that, you know, if they're pitching after school, you know, kind of playing catch but getting more and more force, then that counts. That adds up. Uh, and I'll see patients and I'll say, well, did you rest? And they say, oh, yeah, I definitely rested. And I say, did you stop your travel team? Well, no, there was a tournament and they really needed me to play. So I just played for those four days. And I say, well, did you stop playing at home? Well, no, you know, I definitely want to keep going. I, I don't want to lose my skills or I don't want to fall behind. And, you know, I understand those pressures, but the body's not going to heal if it's not truly rested. So just add it all up in your head, just like calories, it catches up a lot faster than you think it will. All right, so finally finishing up with soccer. Uh, we see a lot of soccer uh, here when I drive around on the weekend. I think that there's not a patch of grass anywhere in the greater Bay Area that's not covered with soccer players, which is great because it's a great sport. So extremely popular. Injuries are usually to the legs, both acute and overuse. Again, sprains, strains, and ACLs. Uh, and then this patellar tendonitis, Oshkid Schlatter's, I see this all the time in soccer players because they're really using your quads. If you see a soccer player's quad, it's like Adonis Herculean size. And that's in a growing skeleton, a lot of stress uh, on the growth plate. And then Achilles tendonitis and Seaver's apophysitis. There can be upper extremity injuries, usually resulting from falls. Uh, can be just sprains, but also I'll see wrist fractures and that kind of thing. And then very rarely concussions, face injuries, neck injuries, and really aggressive games. So prevention, broken record, pretty much similar things, pre-season physical, make sure the equipment is good. So some evidence that molded multi-studded cleats are better than the screw-ins. Uh, poor field conditions that can increase injury rates. So if it's been raining and you have a really slippery field, uh, you're going to have more falls, potentially more injuries. 
And then using properly sized synthetic balls, leather balls can become waterlogged and be more heavy and therefore dangerous, especially when trying to head the ball. And then there actually have been injuries from mobile goals that fall on players. Uh, so if you can get a fixed goal, that'd be great. Uh, and then try not to have little brothers or sisters climbing on those aforementioned goals. Uh, and then again, hydrate adequately and pay attention to the environment. So again, trying to prevent heat stroke. And again, as with all uh, sports, avoid burnout, uh, listen to the body, train for the sport, and then uh, if you take some time off, if you have to take some time off, ease back in with appropriate graduated training. So these are some of the uh, websites. The POSNA website on the top, that's the Pediatric Orthopedic Society of North America. They have great information for parents, not just on uh, sports injuries, uh, but on general pediatric uh, orthopedic conditions. I'd say that they were especially strong in throwing injuries for baseball and then the uh, female athlete triad, which is abnormal menses, osteopenia, and stress fractures. So we'll see that in cross country, runners usually in girls, gymnasts as well, uh, that sort of thing. And then the orthoinfo.aos.org is the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons website. Uh, they have some good, I'd say, more general information. Uh, but still some good uh, handouts for parents. And not just for pediatric orthopedic injuries, but also if you're an athlete yourself and have some aches and pains, there are things for adults as well on that website. And then the Stop, Stop Sports Injury uh, org is the Jim Andrews Stop Program website uh, that really has just an abundance of information, handouts that can be printed for coaches or for other parents, and I think a, a, a lot of good uh, resources. So with that, thank you for your attention.